Okay, are you ready? Thank you very much for coming. We are, I think we are ready to start. Uh, today we have a discussion session. What we are going to do is to solve questions that are similar to what you're going to find in the next, uh, in the, yeah, in the, in next week's uh, final exam. And um, as uh, you can see here, it's a total of seven questions. Uh, let's see if we can cover all of them. Hopefully we will. Uh, and I will start with the GPU and SIMD right now. But before uh, we start, I want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, next Thursday, there in principle, unless, unless we indicate something different, but hopefully not, uh, there won't be a lecture ne next Thursday, so we'll spend this time on preparing the exam. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, Professor Mudlu didn't have time yesterday to uh, cover the entire, all the contents of uh, Interconnects. So what we are going to do today is that we will release two videos. The one corresponding to yesterday's lecture and another one that corresponds to the, uh, the, yeah, the next lecture about uh, Interconnects. Uh, why do we release the video this week and, and don't give the lecture next Thursday. I think that's reasons are obvious. So that's the thing. You should uh, watch both videos because there might be a question related to, to them. Uh, yeah, I think that these are the two things that I wanted to say. Any questions? Okay. So then Let's go to uh, the first question that we are going to solve today. This question is from last year's midterm, I think. Um, and it's about GPUs and, and SIMD. You, for sure, uh, have already solved uh, similar questions, if not the same one. Um, it says, we define the SIMD utilization of a program run on a GPU as a fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept busy with active threads during the run of a program. The following code segment is run on a GPU. Each thread executes a single iteration of the shown loop. Assume that the data values of the arrays A, B, and C are already in vector registers, so you don't need to worry about uh, memory accesses. And um, it gives us uh, one hint. There are six instructions in each thread. I will tell you now how to count these six instructions. A warp in the GPU consists of 64 threads where there are 64 SIMD lanes in the GPU. And there are 64 SIMD lanes in the GPU. So the six instructions are this is the first one, this if, then we have uh, three instructions inside the first if statement, then fifth instruction is second if, and this is the sixth. Right? Why don't we have to worry about the for loop? Because in the end, the for loop, what is uh, simply uh, expressing is the number of threads that we need to use. This is like the sequential code that we are going to parallelize using the multiple threads that the GPU provides, right? And what the question also says is that uh, each of the iterations is going to be assigned to one individual thread. So we already know what's the total number of threads that we need to execute this program, right? It's uh, 4,096, okay? And this uh, takes us to the first question, part A. How many warps does it take to execute this program? How many warps do we need to execute this program? So, the number of warps is the number of threads, which is exactly the same as the number of iterations divided by the size of the warp which is 64 and this is 64 warps this is the number of warps that we need to execute the, uh, this program the number of warps of 32 threads each because in this particular architecture the warp has 32 uh, 60 sorry 64 threads um, in another uh, different uh, problem, you can find 32, but in the end there, was, there won't be uh, any difference. Okay, so these are 10 points for free, as you can see. The second part is more interesting. It says, when we measure the SIMD utilization of this program with one input set, we find that it is 134 over uh, 320. What can you say about the race A, B, and C? Be precise, look at the if branch. So, look at the if branch means 
you have to analyze your code and see what's the influence that the different arrays have on, on the execution of this program and the utilization of this program and as you can see the only uh, important uh, thing to, to, to keep in mind with respect to that is are the um, if statements right and in the if statements the only thing that we have is bi so actually a and c don't have any effect or any influence on what's going to be the actual path of execution so simply we can say what can we say we can say nothing about a and we can say nothing about c but about b we can say many things right and why is that? Because depending on what's the particular value of B, each thread will go through this if statement or this if or none of them. Why is that? Because there are three possible values that are uh, important in, uh, for BI. Uh, 8888, which is we don't execute anything, none of the, uh, of the two paths, or uh, greater than or uh, less than, right? So these are the uh, three possibilities that we have for the values of B. But now the thing is, how do we reason about uh, what's the actual utilization, which here is uh, 134 divided by 320? So what I would recommend you, and let me use this uh, as a scratch pad, what I would recommend you is that you uh, first start looking at what's the total number of instructions that the program has. And we know that the program has six instructions, right? How can we calculate the utilization, let's say, in a uh, generic way uh, when we have six instructions? So what we know for sure is that these six instructions uh, are going to be executed potentially, maybe not, but they are going to uh, obviously depending on what's a, the actual path of execution, but they are going to be executed by 64 warps of 64 threads. And there are some instructions, as you can see here, that are always executed by every thread. In particular, this one and this one. Why is that? Because we have to evaluate the if statement, right? So this is something that I can already include in the numerator. I know that all the threads of all the warps are going to execute the first, this is the first if, and the second if. Okay, and what about the other instructions? The other instructions are these three and this one. We don't know that, right? We don't know how many threads are actually executing these three instructions, but it is likely that not all the threads inside the same warp execute the same instructions, right? So let's assume that there is a number of threads x in each warp that executes these three instructions and there is also a number of threads y um, in every warp that executes that sixth uh, instruction this is y it's not four just to make sure okay and what the question says is that this is equal to 134 divided by 320. And now we have to think a little bit about the numbers that we have on the paper. If you look at this, so if you look at this uh, expression here, we can get rid of all these 64, right? That's super easy, that's clear. And now, if we look at the denominator, we will see that this is equal to 384. And 384 is not equal to 320, right? Actually, 320 is equal to 5 times 64. Which means 
that in this particular case only five instructions are executed by any thread. If we go back to old code, the only possible way that this happens, only five instructions, is that no one executes this instruction. And this way we will have this one for sure, this one for sure, and these three. How many threads? I don't know that. But I know that this number is X. Oh, sorry. Okay? The number of threads that execute these uh, three. So, what I need to do here is to somehow rewrite um, this uh, expression for only five instructions. Uh, this is 64 times 3 plus 64 times 64 divided by 5, 64 times 64. And again, I get rid of this 64 and this is equal to this. And from here, you will find that x is equal to. Okay? So, right answer here is that uh, 2 every 64 elements of B are less than that. Does it make sense? You can check yourself. Uh, there is no other possible answer in this particular question. When we, uh, when we prepare these kind of questions, we usually try that there is only one uh, single uh, possible answer. I'm pretty sure that you can come with uh, other numbers that can uh, take you to different combinations of X and Y, but this doesn't happen in this, uh, in this uh, case. So what, uh, as, a, as a general recommendation, what you have to do is to look at the numbers that you have in front of you and, and reason in, in that way, because the numbers are usually pretty simple. Uh, it shouldn't be difficult for you to uh, reason in this way. Okay? Okay, part C. Is it possible for this program to yield a CIMD utilization of 100%? And the answer is yes. And why is that? Because we, uh, so what it says what should be true about A, B, and C for this to happen. Uh, again, we don't care about A and C, we care about B, same as in the, in the previous part. And if you want to have 100% uh, percent utilization, essentially what you need is that all the 64 threads of a warp which go uh, through the uh, same path, I mean all the 64 threads of a warp always go through the same path. And for that there are uh, three possibilities indeed. And the three possibilities are that the that every 64 elements of B are equal to 8,888 or are greater or are uh, uh, lower than, right? Every 64 elements. So maybe the first 64 elements are equal to 8,888 and the next 64 are uh, greater and the, and the next 64, 64 are lower. Is that clear? Okay. Every 64 elements will be equal or this or that. Okay, and then last part, part D, here it is. What is the lowest SIMD utilization that this program can yield? And this is actually very um, uh, easy to answer. Of course, you would need to calculate the, the number, but uh, it's uh, very related to, to what, uh, what, what we already discussed uh, in, in Part B, right? Because in the end, in Part B, discovered that there were uh, two threads in every warp that are executing um, the same uh, path, right? And, um, and this means that you have two threads. So if you want to decrease the utilization instead of two, use one, right? And so this, uh, this way, uh, 
the, the, I mean, the way to, to achieve the lowest utilization is to have one single thread going through this path and one single thread going through this path. And, um, and here you could calculate uh, something like, so the, the way to calculate the actual number would be 6 times 64 times 64 and here 1 times 64 times 3 which is the number of instructions in the first if and then 64 times 64 plus 1 times 64 times 1 which is the number of instructions in the um, uh, in the in the second if right and the value that you will find here is 132 divided by 3 84 right uh, you also need to explain, but you know the explanation, right? Is one thread uh, is greater, one thread is lower, and the rest are equal, right? So, but do not forget to explain what you're doing and why are you uh, reaching to some particular result. Any question? Okay, good. Then who's the next one, Constantinos? So we're going to discuss a question on uh, memory scheduling. Let's read it first. So here, uh, in the lectures we introduced a variety of ways to tackle memory interference. In this problem we will look at the blacklist in memory scheduler, BLIS, I don't know if you remember it, that reduces unfairness. And there are two key aspects of BLIS that you need to know. So when the memory controller services and consecutive requests from a particular application, this application is blacklisted. And this non-negative integer n is the blacklisting threshold. So when you uh, execute n uh, accesses or your n requests from a specific application, it will blacklist. So this blacklisting period period is cleared periodically after 10,000 cycles. So every 10,000 cycles, you stop blacklisting the applications. You start the process again. So to reduce unfairness, we change the FRFCFS scheduling policy. And instead of FRFCFS, we have non-blacklisted. Uh, ready and then uh, FCFS. So you we first prioritize the non-blacklisted applications request. So when you execute for an application, uh, when you have two applications and one of them is blacklisted, then you start executing the other one until the other one is also blacklisted. So in this problem, we have a memory system that has two channels uh, with two bank sheets, and table one and two show the memory request uh, stream. For, uh, two different, for two different applications in times t equals 0 and t equals 10 and for both tables a request uh, or as we, go to the as we go to the right the requests are uh, younger yes and there are not more, any more requests in this problem mm. yes and for each one of the requests we have information about which, bank, which row in the bank it accesses so a row buffer hit costs 100 cycles, a row buffer miss costs 200 cycles, a row buffer conflict, which means that we need to activate another row on top of another row, so we need to precharge first and then activate another row is 250 cycles, and all row buffers are closed at t equals 0. So as we see in t equals 0, we have the application B, which is application B, this means that application B is the oldest one, it always has its request in the buffers, 
and then t equals 10 we have all the application uh, all the applica all the requests from application a arrived but we didn't service any of these of the requests yet so application b has not serviced any of this any of its requests so let's see the first question so we need to compute the slowdown of each application using the FRFCFS scheduling policy after both threads run to completion and we define as a slowdown the memory latency of the application when it runs together with the other application over the memory latency of the application when it runs alone so in this case we need to calculate first two things So we need to calculate application A latency when it runs alone and application B latency when it runs alone. So let's see again. So when application A runs alone, what will happen? We will execute row 3, we will uh, perform the request to row 3 and as we see there is another request to row 3 so we can actually open this row and uh, perform a hit to row 3 uh, for this request that is in the back and then we perform all the other requests so what we do essentially is we open a row, we have a row miss row 3, then we execute the the, the one that I showed you in the row 3, the request, which is a hit. And then for all the other requests, which are 6, we have conflicts, right? Because they were all different. They were, did not have the same number anywhere. So it's 250, which is the row, row mix conflict, multiplied by 6, which is 1,800 1, cycles. So let's see application B right now. So application B is easier. So in application B, we have one row miss, and then we have one, two, three, four hits, one conflict, one hit, and one conflict. <coughs> so in this case, we have one miss, as I said. Then we have four hits. It was row two. We have four hits. Then we have one conflict for B. Then we have one hit for three, and then one more conflict for the last one. Which is 1,200 cycles. Okay. Right now, we also need to count the uh, late memory latency of application A when we run it with B, and the memory latency of B when we run it with A, right? So let's calculate first. Actually, we will uh, calculate uh, them both at the same time. So it's application A when you run it with B and F, R, F, C, F, S. And application B when you run it with A with F, R, F, C, F, S. So in this case, let's see more in detail this one it's a bit trickier so which is the oldest request the oldest request nothing is open right so the oldest request is from application b so application b will open this row first right so for sure we have in application b a miss and application a will wait for this miss right so we accumulate the cycles in application a also to calculate the latency it's the whole thing right the whole execution then application B will execute one, two, three, four requests because these are all hits. But there is an uh, in application A there is also row two, right? So we need to after before this row three is opened, we need to execute uh, one hit from application A because this request can be serviced. It's in the same row buffer, right? So we can actually perform the request. So what we will do is that we we will have. 200 plus 100 multiplied by 4 and 200, uh, 200 plus uh, 100 multiplied by 4 because we perform an accumulative latency. Then 
we service the row buffer, the row two from application A. So we have a hit in both. Then, as we see here, we need to open row three, right? Because uh, application B is older, so we need to open row three. And we don't have any other uh, ready request. So we need to pay a latency of 250. Okay. Then we need to service a request from application B, right? Because we have row three here and two row threes uh, in application A, but this is older. So we need to pay uh, 100 cycles more. And then we need to service the two requests from application A, which are in the same row, right? It's row three. So 100 multiplied by two, this is application A. Then we need to service row four because it's the oldest one. There is no other ready request. And we need to service row four. So to service row four, we need to pay 250 cycles more for both. And then, how many requests are missing from application A? Because we did not execute all the applications. For, uh, we execute three, two, and three. So we need to uh, perf uh, service request seven, zero, uh, eight, five, and nine, which are five requests, which are all in the different rows, which means five conflicts, right? So we need to perform. So application B is done, because we executed all the requests from application B. So this is the total memory latency. And here we have 250 multiplied by 5. So this number is equal to uh, 2,550 uh, cycles. And this number is equal to 1,500 1, cycles. So how do we calculate the slowdown? So the slowdown of A equals 2,550 uh, 2, over 1,800, which is almost 1.53. How do we do that? This is the application A latency when it runs with application B over the alone execution, right? And the slowdown of B equals 100, uh, 1,500 over 1,200, which equals 1.25. So this is how we'll calculate the two latencies. So like, if there is any question in the exam like this, just be careful on two things. So when you run uh, the application alone, be careful that it's FRFCFS, not FCFS. Like if there are two requests in the queue that can be in the same row, just give the hits. Do not go uh, FCFS because I did the same mistake when I was uh, actually calculating this question. And second is like be careful about the common rows in the queues. Like when you, if you see something like that, be careful that there might be the same rows across the two applications and service them correctly. Okay, let's see the second question. So, if we use the Bliss scheduler, which blacklists, for what values of n will the slowdowns of both applications be equal to this obtained without FRFCFS? So what we want here is the exact same slowdown, right? And we want to have this exact same slowdown, we need to have the same uh, order of servicing the requests. So the way this can happen is twofold. So first, if we have n equals zero, then we execute this, the applications with FRFCFS, right? Because we don't never blacklist. So one option is to have n equals zero. So the second option, like I will go a bit, I will do some trial and error. So if we, if we have, let's say four, if we have four, we will execute one, two, three, four. Then application A will be blacklisted. And then we need to execute two, because this is the open one. And then one, two, three. This makes application A blacklisted. 
and then both of them are blacklisted when you continue the execution. But this way, application B will be blacklisted, right? So it would not have the same slowdown for sure. And application A will run faster probably. So if we do five, it's one, two, three, four, five. Application B is blacklisted. We execute row two, and then the same thing. So application B will be blacklisted if the threshold is below uh, six. So we need to at least have six, uh, n equals six. Because if we have n equals six, we will do one, two, three, four, five. We will execute this request in row two, then six here, and then we do not blacklist application B because we execute the request from application A, right? So then we will open this row, uh, row three. We will execute something from row three, and then nothing will be blacklisted. In this case, none of the applications will be blacklisted if we have n greater than six, greater or equal than six. If we have something, if we have n less than six, then the, uh, B will be blacklisted and we will not have the same slowdown. So in this case, we have two options. It's n equals zero or n equal greater than six. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. Mm. Yes. So, for what values of n, the blacklisting threshold, will the slowdown of a be less than 1.5? So, do you think it's possible to have a slowdown less than 1.5 in this application? I have a question about the last one. Yes. Um, if you said n equal to one, um, two to one, yes. I think you might be able to get like a similar result. Like, for instance, you would still blacklist B after one axis, but then you would hit A and blacklist that immediately as well, and then it would execute them as normal, like before, right? So if you do that, you will have a row miss here, right? Uh, but it does the row buffer hit first, right? Which means it would um, select row two from application A. So you mean that if you have, uh, if you, uh, you have a conflict here, yeah, and then you execute row two, yeah, and so they would both be blacklisted at this point, and then you would go back to B because it's older, and then do all the row up hits, and then you would execute as previously. I think this is an edge case. It doesn't matter. It's correct, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I think I agree with you. Uh, yes, because we can service row two, right? So it's it's the same thing essentially. Uh, yes, I think that the slowdown will be the same. You're right. Good catch. And then equals one. Yes, sorry. So in this case, to have a slowdown of A which is less than 1.5, we need something that blacklists uh, B, but it does not blacklist A. Because if it blacklists A, the slowdown cannot be uh, greater than less than 1.5, right? But this cannot happen. With given the memory request that we have, if you if you see it carefully, this cannot happen. We cannot do that. We cannot have the A application uh, running and B, uh, uh, the B application blacklisted and the A not blacklisted. So in this case, this cannot happen. This is impossible. We cannot. If you, if you check at the if you check at the patterns, it's in, it's impossible <coughs> to run. Application A without blacklisting it and blacklisting B. Event is if event is Greek or A greater than zero, right? This is an easy question, I think. 
So, for what values of the blacklisting threshold will be experienced the maximum slowdown from the blacklisting scheduler? So you know that if n is greater than 6, as we discussed, or is equal to 1 or is equal to 0, then you have the same slowdown as FRFCFS. So what you would do in this question, you would brute force from n equals 2, 3, 4 and 5 to see what is the, what is the slowdown for each one of these uh, numbers. So you need to brute force n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5 to see which of these numbers give the maximum slowdown. Is this clear to everyone? So in this case it's n equals 5. So if you execute with n equals 5, then you get the maximum slowdown uh, of, uh, for application B, that is 2150 cycles. Okay. So I think this is easy. Based if you answer actually the question, the B, correctly, this will be really easy. And then that's the last question. What is a simple mechanism that we can use instead of bliss to make the slowdowns of both A and B equal to 1? Does anyone have any idea of how to do that? So you want both applications to run isolated in this case. And I think you discussed it in the class. Is there any way that you can run the applications isolated? Which, how is this technique called? Okay, it's memory channel partitioning, correct. So the technique is called MCP, memory channel partitioning. Yes, in this case we will have uh, the two applications running in different channels and we won't have any kind of conflicts between the banks. And it will run, the, the slowdown will be the same, which is one. I think this was one of the, let's say, easy questions. But you need to be careful, like even if you don't know the Bliss scheduler, you can actually essentially solve it. It's in the exam. But be careful, like this kind of stuff, with n equals 1, for example. Where's the next one? Do you need this? Okay, uh, we are going to solve a question on emerging memory technology, which is in the, yeah, which was the first question of the last final exam. Now let's first read the problem. So researchers, researchers at Lindtel developed a new memory technology called LM, which is non-volatile. The access latency of LM is close to that of DRM while it provides higher density compared to the latest DRAM technology. And LM has one shortcoming, however, it has a limited endurance, i.e., yeah, uh, memory cell stops functioning after a million writes are performed to the cell. Yeah, so uh, it means that yeah, a memory cell cannot store reliably uh, the requested data. So yeah, actually, we can try to write a data, but yeah, it does not guarantee the, um, let's say, the lifetime or reliably, reliably uh, storing time uh, for the request. So this is, let's say this is yeah, P, uh, which is a program cycles uh, that allow for a cell. Yeah. And the first question is asking, yeah, yeah, let's read the first question. Linta markets 
a new computer system with LM to have a lifetime of two years and the following specifications. Okay, so their target lifetime is two years. Uh, 4 gigabytes of LM as main memory with a perfect reliability mechanism. Yeah, somehow, somehow they they can provide a perfect reliability link. It means that if, even if we try to write a data on a very specific location, yeah, uh, the memory device somehow distributes the requests, uh, evenly distributes the requests to the underlying cells. So we we, so this, this assumption uh, allows us to forget about the access pattern of uh, some programs. Okay, so this, this value is also important. This is capacity. Yeah, let, let me put this as C. Yeah, C is 4 gigabytes. Uh, it means uh, 2232 yeah, bytes. Okay, yeah, and the processor is in order and there is no memory level parallelism. It means that yeah, we cannot, uh, with the system, we cannot overlap the latency of the device. And yeah, it takes 4 nanoseconds to send the memory request from the processor to the memory controller, and it takes 20 nanometers, 20 nanoseconds to send the request from the memory controller to LM. The write latency of LM is 40 nanosecond. So to write a data to a flash, no, no, not flash, an LM, LM cell, yeah, it takes the total time is, yeah, let me put this as T write is T uh, transfer time from the processor to memory controller. Let's put this T PC. Uh, P, M, and another transfer from memory controller to LM, and the program latency of LM, and it's 64, right? nanoseconds. And LM is uh, word addressable, so each write requests a size 8 bytes to memory. So there, there is another important uh, value here. Yeah, I will put this as S. The size of a request is mm, yeah, 8 bytes, means 2 to 3 bytes. Okay, the final question is, yeah, a student, an, an ETH student tests the lifetime of the system and finds that this new computer system cannot guarantee a lifetime of two years. So she writes a program to wear out the entire LM device as quickly as possible. Yeah, and it finally, it is finally asking how fast yeah, sh she is able to wear out the device. <coughs> it means that actually, uh, this is the uh, uh, guaranteed lifetime at the worst case, right? So I will put this as t. So to calculate t, yeah, we yeah we simply <laughs> we can simply calculate the t by multiplying the number of right requests uh, necessary to uh, wear out this entire LM device and since there is no parallelism or yet uh, there is no way for us to overlap the latency so we can simply multiply the uh, time for uh, handling a write request is t right right and the number of write requests required to uh, wear out entire LM yeah, let's first think about the, how many uh, write requests is necessary to write a whole the device, hold the device at just one time. Then, yeah, <coughs> we need to uh, fill the data for uh, the entire capacity. So let's say, let's first use the terminology C. And yeah, we 
can write uh, as large as the size s. So the total uh, number of requests, uh, write requests should be uh, c over s. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we repeat this uh, write request uh, for the limited program cycle of a cell, right? So our final formula should be like this. Is it clear? Okay. Yes. So this, so only the simple calculation is left here. Like this. And let me check the, so we are yeah, doing the right thing here. So this, this C, the unit of C is right, right? And this yeah, size is also right. And there is no unit for P because it's just uh, the number of times. And this is, this is second, right? Yeah, so we are now uh, calculating the time for yeah time to yeah time necessary to wear out the entire device so yeah you can just cancel this and yeah cancel this and like this yeah and Okay, yeah, somebody, <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we can, yeah, so the final form, yeah, is it okay to put just this value for the final answer for this question? And uh, as I remember, this is just 300 uh, uh, something days. So yeah, it cannot guarantee the target lifetime at all. Can I move on? Yeah. So we need to improve the lifetime, the guaranteed lifetime of this device. Yeah. And here is the another information. Uh, LRAM works in the multi-level cell mode in which each memory cell stores two bits. Yeah. As we have learned in the lecture, yeah, by putting some distinguished uh, different states, so making some distinguished states. Uh, for a cell, yeah, we can uh, the a cell can represent multiple um, bit value. For example, if we store two bit value, two bit values for a cell, yeah, we need to make four different states uh, by using a cell. Uh, and students decide to improve the lifetime of LM cells by using the single level cell SLC yeah mode. So the Current so the, in part A, yeah, so a cell uh, stores uh, two two bits, but yeah, in part B, yeah, we change the cell to store just one bit value. It means that our capacity, so our capacity of SLC uh, LM device is half of MLC device, right? <coughs> And when LM is used in SLC mode, the lifetime of each cell improves by a factor of 10. It means yeah, the limited program cycle of SLC is 10 times of that of MLC device. And the write latency decreases by 75%. So we, we should be careful for this because yeah, we use T right MSC. It means yeah the time required to write a data to uh, a word to the uh, LM device, but it consists of T the transfer time from processor to memory controller and transfer time from memory controller to LM. 
and the right return C over LM. So this 75% 75, 75 reduction is only for this. So recall the value. Yeah, so this was it. This was what it was, and yeah. So SS the right, so effective right rate turn C over SLC, it should be like this. Right? <coughs> and is 34. And what is the lifetime of the system using SSC mode if we repeat the experiment in part A with all S remaining the same in the system? Yeah. And so again, yeah, we need to calculate the lifetime of this LM when it is used in uh, SSC mode. And you can use use this use the same formula here and actually SLC so the si request size is not changed so we can use the same uh, value for this and capacity SLC uh, limited programming cycle of SLC and T right for SLC and yes and let's say okay so this should be same as MLC and the capacity is reduced by half and the program cycle is increased 10 times and this is this is quite tricky then and yeah you can use it like this right yeah so we know this value yeah was mm, yeah so actually you can the only thing left is just to simplify this final formula yeah Mm, yeah, let's see. Mm. Yeah, so this means, yeah, by, by using LM device as a SLC uh, device, yeah, we can improve, the improvement gain is about less than 3x, right? So, as I remember, this is uh, about 1000x yeah, x days. And the final, the final form, yeah, should be, yeah, you don't need to calculate the exact number of this. Is it clear or clear? Yeah, so, so you can, so it means that, yeah, finally it meets the uh, target lifetime of the device. But it does not mean that there is no problem now because yeah, we reduce the capacity of the main memory system. So there should be some drawback of this approach because yeah, we, the total capacity of memory system is decreased. So yeah, there should be more, um, it incurs more IOs, uh, page faults uh, in these systems. So even if even if we are so the the excess latency is also decreased, but yeah, we cannot uh, guarantee that the performance of this uh, memory system uh, is improved by using SS device. Okay, the final question is, yeah, provide a mechanism that would increase the guaranteed lifetime of the computer system without changing the physical circuitry of LM. From the baseline computer system in part A, describe the changes required to, required to guarantee a computer system lifetime of two years with your mechanism. Okay, so 
Again, the guaranteed lifetime uh, should be capacity, so uh, capacity over uh, request size, and in this system, and uh, uh, program cycle limited program cycles, and effective write latency. And effective write latency is composed of uh, um, processor to memory controller transfer time and memory controller to yeah, LM transfer time and the program latency of LM. Yeah, we, so we cannot change uh, any circuitry of LM. So we cannot, so there, there, is, there are a lot of ways to improve the lifetime. So, for example, we can improve the lifetime by improving the capacity, or yeah, or yeah, limited programming cycles, or reducing the size. Yeah, but it it also uh, affects it to each other, affect each other's uh, value. So it is not quite straightforward. But yeah. The assumption is we cannot change any circuitry of LM, so we cannot change the capacity first, and size also, request size also, and the program cycle. So the only thing, and, and also the program latency. So only thing we can change is just uh, transfer time between pro processor or um, processor and memory controller, or uh, from memory controller to LM. So and this uh, this lifetime should be uh, more than uh, let's say more than two years. And capacity is not changed. And size also not changed. And uh, limited P program cycle is not also changed. So this and yeah let's say this okay and this is also not changed for example so in this example it was 40 nanosecond and we can only change these two values and I'll put this as x yeah, and yeah, we needed to increase uh, this transfer time between the process and yeah, process to the memory uh, to satisfy this inequality. So this, uh, I think, yeah, it is sufficient to, to uh, just minimize this formula. And yeah, two years is um, second, right? And like this. And it, as far as I remember, is about fifty nanosecond. Is it clear? It is not very good approach because we uh, will not use the potential performance of LM. Yeah, but if the our our most important concern is the uh, is to guarantee the lifetime. Yeah, this yeah, we can we can say this approach as a throttling, and yeah, it is commonly used in, when we design uh, a real systems. Yeah, and the required value, so the um, delay value is 40 so actually actually our original uh, transfer time was 24 nanosecond total yeah so we double the transfer time just for uh, guaranteeing the uh, lifetime of the device to two years okay it's all so any questions for this Thank you.
Who is next? Yeah. This question is about prefacing. Hope, hope that you are, you guys are enjoying the prefacing lab. So yeah. So okay, uh, let's read the question first. So an an ET student writes two programs A and B and runs them on three different toy machines M1, M2, and M3 to determine the type of prefacing mechanism these machines are using. Now she observes that program A and B to have the following request access pattern. The access pattern is shown like this. And uh, so these access pa these access patterns are actually to the cache block, but not the actual cache address. Uh, not the block uh, cache block addresses. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, program A actually has 27 accesses, whereas program B has 501 accesses, and the access pattern goes like this. And then the student is also able to measure the accuracy and the coverage of the prefacing mechanism in each of the machines, and the uh, coverage and accuracy for each of the machines for each of this program looks like this. So now uh, there are some more information that we have uh, is this. So basically the uh, so the first information says that the prefecture prefaces into a fully associative cache which is an a cache block wide and the prefectures have large enough resources to detect and store all access patterns. Third one is the pre each cache block access is separated long enough in time so that the prefetch is issued can complete before the next access happens. So that means there is no problem of the timeliness. And uh, there are okay. So there are five different possible choices for the prefetching mechanisms that we know beforehand. So the first two are the Markov prefetcher. Three and four is a variant of a next block prefetcher. And the fifth one is a stride prefecture. The first two basically says that okay, uh, Markov prefecture which can learn and store up to four entries. Second one can store up to ten entries. Third one is just the next line prefecture, like uh, next the next block, exact next block. And the fourth one is the fourth next block basically. And then the fifth one is the stride prefecture. So now the question is that uh, so okay, no, none of them have any confidence bit and. They starts with empty table and everything is fine and then the prefetch degree is only one. So that means we only send one prefetch request for each demand access. So now the question is that, uh, so determine what type of prefetching mechanism each of the ever mentioned mechanism machines use. So, um, so the first approach to solve this problem is whenever you see this kind of question in exam, it's, it's better to simply just go with this program access pattern and just evaluate how this program would behave like how a normal uh, let's say these prefetches these five type of prefetches would behave for this access pattern so i'm jumping in straight towards the solution itself so i have the solution printed out because it's like too much writing but let's go through the solution so so if you recall what is a markov prefecture markov prefecture basically understands the correlation of the cache block addresses so basically whenever you have a cache block address a and a plus one so it learns that a plus one is followed by a that's the correlation it's learning similarly it actually learns a plus two is followed by a plus one a plus three is followed by a plus two and so on so the idea of prefetching in this context is whenever you see let's say a it would actually issue a prefetch for a plus one before uh, after that so that's the mark of prefetch right and the uh, and we know that okay table size basically d determines that how how much information you can store how much knowledge you can store actually so let's see so in the first case we have this 27 accesses from, from program a so now let, let's see if our pro, uh, markov table prefetcher has only four entries so that means it can learn so let's say a 
a plus 1 is followed by a, that's one entry. a plus 2 is followed by a plus 1, that's another entry and so on. So that means by the time it actually reaches a plus 4, so you have four uh, three learnings, a plus a to a plus 1, a plus 1 to a plus 2, a plus 2 to a plus 3 and a plus 3 to a plus 4. That's full learning, right? Now if you go to a plus 8, you are actually dropping the first learning. And a plus 8 is something which is completely new to the prefecture. Prefecture actually haven't seen this cash block address before. So it cannot make any prediction in this case, right? So if we just extrapolate the entire thing, so it's basically, it's just learning something. It doesn't have enough storage to apply its learning. So that means it's not prefetching anything at all. Because none of the addresses are repeating and when the address actually repeats, by that time it actually forgot everything because it doesn't have enough information to store. So, so that, that's why its coverage is zero, accuracy is zero. It's not prefetching anything, coverage is also zero. But accuracy should be 100% technically, but yeah. But okay, so let, let's go to the second case. So the second case is basically like you can actually store a plus, a plus 1 followed by a and so on right so if you if you see how many entries are here that, that's nine entries so that means a 10 entry table is actually can store up to this entry that a is actually followed by a plus 64 till this you have the knowledge now the prefetcher actually sees that okay a plus one came again now it a actually came again so it, it start prefetching a plus one because it has enough storage to remember that a plus 1 is always followed by A. So that means any further access is actually prefetchable. So in this case, then we, we can see that, okay, uh, the coverage is 17 out of 27 accesses and the accuracy is 17 out of 18, which is like pretty accurate. Make sense? Okay. Now let's go to the second one. Uh, for, sorry, third one. So third one basically says the next block access. That's a very basic prefetcher. So A predicts A plus 1. A plus 1 is good. A plus 1 also predicts A plus 2, A plus 2 is also covered, A plus 2 predicts A plus 3, A plus 3 predicts A plus 4, everything is covered. So that means A plus 1, A plus 2 and A plus 3 and A plus 4 is predictable. right? Now A plus 4 will predict A plus 5 which is not present, so that's completely gone. Now A plus 8 will predict A plus 9 which is also gone, I mean it's, it, program is not accessing this one. So none of these accesses are predictable. So that means out of these 27 accesses, only this 12, right? Yeah, uh, um, only these 12 is on predictable. Nothing else. Does it make sense? Stop me if, if, if you are not following me in, in, at any point. Okay. So, so in in this case, then what what is the coverage? Coverage is four out of nine, and the accuracy is four out of nine again. Uh, okay. Yeah. Ideally, we should measure accuracy based on how much you prefetched. But okay, so yeah, so so in in this case, the so the coverage is four by nine. It's, it's, it's is it clear, right? Okay, uh, so let's go to the fourth type of prefetcher. So the, that's the fourth next block. Okay, so fourth next block again the same thing. A a plus one is not covered. A plus two is also not covered. A plus three is also not covered because nobody can actually preface this for for these guys. A plus four can be prefetched from A because that's a four, fourth next cache line. So that, that, that guy is covered. A plus 8 is also prefetched by A plus 4. That means this guy is also covered. Anything apart from these, it's not covered. So then these are also gone. So again, you can come up with the coverage numbers and the accuracy number. Make sense? Now let's go to a, like a more... <coughs> Well, more complex prefecture, let's say stride prefecture. So stride prefecture does what? It just learns the last stride it actually seen and it just applies the, uh, that stride again, right? So whenever it actually sees a plus one, the last axis was a, it learns that there is a stride of plus one, it just uh, prefects for the next stride. Then a plus two is covered, right? Similarly, a plus one and a plus two, it learns plus one stride. A plus three is also covered. Similarly, a plus four is also covered, right? Now let's think, uh, a plus four and a plus three, it actually learned of uh, stride of plus one. So it will probably prefetch for plus one, a plus five. The program generated a plus eight, so you're not covered. A plus eight and a plus four, it learned a stride of four. It will prefetch a plus 12. But actually program made a demand request to A plus 16, which is also not covered. And subsequently, none, none of these are covered. 
is it good so that means we again ended up having these many of the covered request and none of them are covered from this access pattern make sense okay so now let's move to the second program okay so the second program as we have seen the second program is this right so it's just 501 accesses and it's a arithmetic B, I mean arithmetic progression so b b plus 2 b plus 4 b plus 6 and so on b plus 998 b plus 1000 so you can easily guess the stride prefetch is going to work very well in this case okay so now let's see markup pref uh, mark prefetches now think of this none of the cache line addresses are repeating so markup prefetch is useless in this case it doesn't matter how many entries you can store both of them is useless so markup prefetch second program useless Zero, 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 zero. Okay. Now let's go to the next block. The first next block. Well, we are not doing the first next blocks anyway. Again, zero. Fourth next block. Some of them can be covered. So let's see. So B, B plus two. B plus two doesn't have any candidate to issue prefetch for this guy. So B plus two is uncovered. B, we cannot cover anyway. B plus four. Yes, we can cover. B plus six. B plus two will generate for B plus six. So B plus six is covered, and subsequently everything is covered. So that means apart from the first two axes, everything is covered. Make sense? So that means its uh, coverage is pretty high and everything is good. Let's look at the stride prefecture. Stride prefecture is again the same thing. B and B plus 2, it actually learned the stride of plus 2 and it applied the stride again. And as the program actually behaves very regularly, that it, it, it just repeats the stride 2 again and again. So it just simply covers everything. Right, so that means we we actually ended up having two prefetches for program two, which exactly has a similar uh, coverage and accuracy. I mean, yeah, I mean, accuracy is little bit off, but almost similar. So now, once you have done this in, in entire calculation, let, let's say exhaustive calculation for all of these pro workloads and the prefetches, you just tally up with these guys, which one of them actually matches, right? So program B. And for machine 1 and machine 3 is almost the same thing. So that means you know that okay, either it can be the next plus 4 or let's say the stride prefecture. But as you as we have seen that okay, program A has different property, we can simply go and check which one fits best, and that essentially ends up here. So machine 2, everything is 0, that means it's most likely Markov prefecture. So yeah, Markov prefecture, it's out. And then machine one, it's fourth next block, and machine three is the stride prefecture. Make sense? Ah, good. Yeah. yeah uh, for the fourth next block prefecture, mm -hmm. program A on the bottom, on the other side. Yeah, sure. Um, is the reason that we can do uh, like A plus eight, um, or sorry, A plus four from A? Mm -hmm. uh, do we do we know that because of the property like in the beginning where it says the prefetchers have uh, eight cache blocks to insert stuff? So that it, it hangs around, right? The when you prefetch from A to A plus four, it That's hangs right. around despite you prefetching for A plus one, A plus three, A plus three, it still stays there because we our cache is big enough. Oh no 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 no. So 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 the program actually demands these guys, right? So now think of this. So whenever we the program demanded A, mm -hmm. the prefetcher knows that whatever is demanded, I am just f fetching four cache blocks ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm just fetching the fourth cache block ahead, not four cache blocks. So Whenever program uh, accesses A, it will actually inject a prefetch for uh, A plus 4. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So A, pl A plus 1 and A plus 2, it, it, it just yeah. comes and then un uh, uncovered. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever the program actually touches A plus 4, mm -hmm. it again generates a prefetch for A plus 8. Mm -hmm. So that's why A plus 8 is also covered yep, yep. and nothing else is covered. Okay. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, but how long does A plus 4 actually stay for in the, like, stay ready? In the cache. Oh yeah, does it depend on... Uh, well, okay, yeah. I, I, in the ideal scenario, yes, it, it, it actually depends on the cache. But as we have said here that... Um, uh, wait. Yeah, I mean, the prefecture prefetches into a fully associative cache whose size is 8 cache block. I mean, it's big enough to hold. 8 cache block means you can simply think of 8 cache blocks, like prefetch cache blocks you can hold, right? So by the time the demand actually comes it should not like the demand and the this prefetch 
should not be eight cash blocks ahead, uh, which is not happening. So, yeah. Okay. This one? This cache, these eight cash blocks will have, so if we have A, it's A and A plus 4. Um, and A plus 2. I won't say that. Yeah, because it, it just says that it, it prefetches into a fully associative cache. Maybe you can think of it as a different cache, like a stream buffer or something. Yeah, but, but the idea is like if you have made a prefetch, let's say, um, I mean, you have made a prefetch to cache block X. And you have generated, let's say, eight prefetches after that, and then this x is getting demanded. Then x is gone. Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, you, you you can think of this as a prefetch buffer, but yeah, probably the, if you just add it to a normal cache, this will get complex. But yeah, let's not think about that. Is it clear? Okay. Any any more questions? So yeah, then. Okay, uh, let's get continue with these questions. So, this question here is about a symmetric immute core. So, I'm going to read the question first. A microprocessor manufacturer asks you to design a symmetric immute core processor for modern workloads. We should optimize it assuming that the workload has 80% of its work in a parallel portion. This is going to be important. Your design contains one large core and several small cores which share the same design. Assume that the total area that you have to place those cores is 32 units of area. So then you have the configurations of the large and small cores. For the large cores, uh, it is n times faster than a single small core and it takes an area of um, n cube area, units of area a uh, dynamic power of six, six times and uh, six times n and a static power of n watts for the small cores you can fit as many small cores in the die after placing the large cores the area is one unit of area per small core the dynamic power is one and the static power is 0 0.5 so they say in the question that the parallel portion executes only on the small cores, while the serial portion executes only on the larger core. So based on those information, you're going to ask answer the following questions. So first, they ask what is the configuration, number of small cores and sizes of the large cores is going to result in the best performance. So all of the information that you have here is important. So first, the fact that the your application can take 80% is 80% parallel and 20% is going to be serial. So you know that the speed up is going to be given by 1 over the this is the serial part plus the parallel part and this is equal to 80% of applications parallel, then 0.2% of 0 0.2 uh, of your application is going to be serial, and the out of the the large core is n times faster than the in other core, the, the small cores, right? So this is going to be n times the rest of the execution, 0.8 is parallel. And how many parallel cores can you fit? You're going to be able to 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 fit. 32 cores minus uh, 32 minus the area that you have available, right? So you already placed one larger core, so this area is uh, minus n cube. Cube. Any question about this? How we formulate this equation? For example, so we are going to assume that the time to execute the application is going to be the time of the serial part plus the time of the parallel part. And this is equal to the time of the zero part is 0 0.2 over n plus the part of the time of the parallel part 0 0.8 over 32 minus n cube. And then you need to find out which values of n give you the the best uh, time, the smaller time. Uh, for this, 
what we can do in the solutions, what we do, we test different values of n. Um, so here, for example, you have n equals to 1. And then you're going to have the, the time for the zero part, the time for the parallel part, and the total time. So if you have n equals to 1 here, you're going to have the serial part is going to take 0 0.1 divided by 1, 0 .0 0 0.2 divided by 1, 0 0.2, and the parallel part is 0 0.8 divided by 32, and I have here the number is 0. Point, is, a pro, is around 0 0.03, and the total time is 0 0.2323, exactly. If n is equal to 2, this is going to be 0 0.2 divided by 2, that is 0 0.1, and here is going to be also something close to 0 0.03. And the total time is 0 0.13. If n is equal to 3, this time for the serial part is 5, the time for the parallel part is 0 0.16, oh sorry, this is not 5, it's 0 0.07 and the total time is 0 0.23 so you can continue doing this this table until you reach the total area that you can have in the chip but we figure out that actually n is equals to 2 is, is going to give you the best uh, timing so if you have n equals to 2 it means that you can place um, you can place 32 minus n cube 32 minus uh, 2 to the third this is 24 is small course and the area for the larger core the area is given by um, the area is n cube so is 8 any question about this? So, in the, in the solution, we solve it by calculating based on placing values for the table, for, the, for this equation here, but it's not necessary. We can derivate and find the maximum minimum values here. Uh, also, if you want to guarantee that you find out the best solution. So, this is the first question, the first part. Then they ask you to calculate what is going to be the energy for this design considering that the, the best configuration that you find in part A. So n is equals to 2. So energy is going to be given by the energy of the small cores plus the energy of the larger core. And the small core The energy is equal to power versus time. So it's going to give him by the power, the dynamic power for the small core. Plus the dynamic power for the small core, oh sorry, the static power for, for the small core. Times the small core is acute only this, the parallel part, right? the time that it takes to execute the um, parallel part. However, while this core, the parallel part is executing, uh, while the, the serial part is executing, this core is still in the die, right? So you need to consider the, the static energy also that this core is going to take while it's not doing any computation. So plus the, the power, the static power, of the small core while the serial portion is being executed and for the per the oh sorry and also you did the number of small cores that you have here right you have 32 minus n cube cores right you have 24 uh, small cores for the larger core, we have exactly the same equation. So you have power versus time, and it's going to be the power for the larger core. 
uh, for dynamic power plus the power for the large core the static power times the time to run the serial part and similar to what I did here we also have to consider the static power while the, the, this core is not doing computation but the, the parallel part is being executed so power for the large core the static power times the time for the parallel part that is the time that this core is not doing anything and if you look at the solution I'm not going to play put some numbers here is 24 I guess 26 times the t for the serial part times 38 times for the parallel part and the, this give you t 3.74 joules the times here are just times the times for the serial parallel part that we calculate before for these part uh, when you calculate like the time for oh sorry this is uh, when you're calculating like the time for serial and time for parallel these are the, these are these don't have units right because you're calculating based off like a percentage and you're applying like like the relative like computing power of the dies right so what we know is that is it, it's a ratio in the end. You are right. There is no unit here because well, the only thing that we say is that the larger core is n times faster than the other folder cores, and everything is based on this number. So, is this the question? Yeah. So, I guess like when we're calculating the other side, the energy consumption on the back. Um, uh, like I can see like that given these numbers that we calculated in the first part, we compare all the numbers, all the energy consumptions to each other. Um, but is it still possible to like create uh, to have this in joules because we don't have this in seconds, right? We can assume if you assume that the time uh, the time that the, the small, one small core is going to 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 take to calculate some computation is one second okay. is what I'm doing right here. Okay. Yeah. Then you can calculate the joule like that. So it's kind of implicit, but you can also do the same in the exam. Thanks. Any other question? Okay. So for part C, uh, it says that for the okay for the configuration between part A, you are considering to use the larger core to allocate to collaborate with the small core on the execution of the parallel uh, portion. So now, before the serial portion was being executed only on the uh, larger core and the parallel portion only on the on the on the parallel part, and now the par this, the larger core is going to help executing the parallel code also. And the first item item that asks you is what is the overall performance improvement compared to the performance obtained in part A if the larger core collaborates with the parallel portion. So. The, the equation that you have is similar than before, so 1 over, this, the time for the serial part does not change at all, so is it still the same, 0 0.2 over m plus 0 0.8 over 32 minus uh, n cube, this is the number of, uh, that is going to take, the time that is going to take for the small cores, but now you have some help from from the larger core to help you in the parallel portion. And he asks you what is the performance improvement So for the parallel portion. So before, you have that the parallel portion was going to, it was taking um, 32 minus n cube. And now you have that is going to take 32 minus n cube plus n. Remember that n is equal to 2 because you need to consider the same value that you found in in part A of the, uh, the question. So this time here is 0 0.8 over uh, 24 and this one here is 0 0.8 over 26. So the improvement that you're going to have is um, 1 over the other and is t, t over 2 that is going to be 26 over 24 and this is going to be 0.8 percentage 
zero on this value. Any question here? Okay. So now it asks also what is going to be the energy now that the larger core uh, collaborates. What the energy change when you the larger core collaborates in the parallel execution. So recall that the energy is the energy of the the large core plus the energy of the small core. So the equation that you had before, I'm going to reuse the equation. because it's quite similar. For the small core, this equation does not change. For the larger core, now, here, we are not, when you, the, 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 the parallel portion is executing, this core is not sitting idle anymore. So, the time that is going to, the power that is going to be consumed is not only the static power, it's also the, the, the dynamic power for this core. times the time for the parallel portion. So this is the only change in the, the equation that you have. And is, this is going to lead you to uh, energy, I'm going to check in the solution, is 26 times the serial part, same as before. And now it's 50 times the parallel portion. Uh, pay attention here how much the, the, the energy expand uh, on the parallel portion increases now because recall that the, the dynamic power for the serial part for the larger core is 6 times larger than the 6n while uh, the parallel, the, the, for the other core is just one unit of, of, of oh, it was 6n over n, I, I forgot actually Oh yes, it's only one watt and the other one is 6 N watts. So the larger core takes significantly more amount of uh, dynamic power to execute than the other, than the small core. And this is going to give you 3.74 joules. While the other one, no, this is wrong. This is the other one. This is 4 point something. 4.6. while the other one was 3.74. And then the next question is, does it make sense to ask the, the larger core to help in the parallel portion? Because you have a 8% improvement in performance, but at high energy, your energy increases from 3.74 to 4.6. So an idea if it makes sense, what you guys think? So does not make sense, right? To because your energy is going to increase uh, uh, a lot when I mean, if you execute in the order for the core. If you want to make sure if it makes uh, sense or not, there is one metric that is called EDP, energy delay product. That measure is actually the trade-off between energy and time or power and time consumption. So this equation is pretty much energy times time. So if you calculate the EDP when the, the out of order core, no, the larger core is not helping, you're going to, to, to have that the energy we spent was 3.674 joules and the time was 0.13. And this is going to give you, let me check my number, 0 0.48. While, while the other core is helping, the large core is helping, this energy goes up for 4.6 joules. And the time reduces by 8%, it's around 0.12-ish. And this is going to give you 0 0.55 something. So this metric is lower is better, so it does not make sense. You don't have to compute the metric. If you have the solution, you can just justify saying that uh, does not make sense because of this argument of uh, the energy increases uh, and the performance does not reduce, uh, does not improve that much. 
but if you know the metric by hand by head and want to make sure that is the case you can use the metric also are we not allowed to use calculators for this because yeah. i feel like this question is very computational and you are not allowed to use calculators in the lab uh, for the exam um, most of the time if you just uh, uh, place the equation there we are going to grade based on the on the if you assemble the equation properly if you want to do the computation you can approximate is what we say here in the exam um, but um, yes yeah, so if you need to do the computation you can approximate for example for the first part you need to do the computation right to figure out the timing <coughs> so you can just approximate you can approximate uh, using some values Two decimal points is already fine, <laughs> yes. Okay, part D. Uh, now assume that we are going to optimize the serial portion of the code and the serial portion is going to become smaller. This gives you the possibility to reduce the size of the large core and to improve performance. For the large core with an area of n minus 1 um, to the power of 3, uh, where n is the value obtained in part A, so it's still 2, what should be the fraction of the serial portion that will lead you to a better performance than part A? So, solution this here. So, we have. that the serial portion, we don't know anymore how much is the serial portion, right? But we know from the equation that it is 1 minus the parallel portion. And the time that is going to take for the, for the execution of the serial portion, we are going to assume that it's proportional to the area that you have, because now you have a, 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 small, a smaller core, so it's going to take, uh, this core is going to, not going to be as fast here, right, as before. So it's going to assume that this is proportional to the area, so it's going to take n is my n minus one uh, in terms of time to execute the serial portion. Uh, the parallel portion still takes uh, p units of time, and we still have the same amount of area, so uh, we can place 32 minus n minus one uh, uh, to the power of three uh, number of uh, small cores. So we want that we want this. Uh, we are going to assume as before. The time is going to be given by one minus p and minus one plus p thirty two minus and minus one to the power of three. And you want this time here to be smaller uh, than the the previous time, right? That was zero point thirteen from the new calculate in the in part a. Assuming that n is equal to 2, you have that 1 minus p, this is going to be 1, plus p, um, 32, minus, this is 1 also, so this is actually 31, should be smaller than 0 0.13, and you do the calculation, you're going to be finding out that p should be larger than 0 0.9. So the parallel portion should be larger than 90% of the execution time now. If you still want to you, uh, have performance improvements, um, so you, but he is asking about the serial portion. So the, par the serial portion can be at most 10%, right? Is one minus 90, 0.9. Any question? So I don't understand your no. expression, but like, let me try to explain again. This portion here is the serial part, right? So I'm dividing this one here by 31 because of the amount of is of small cores that you can place, right? The amount that the 
since we know that the, the amount of uh, uh, serial of small core that you can place is 32 minus the area of the larger core because we place it first so it's going to be 32 minus n minus 1 to the, to the third and here is just the serial portion it is is by how fast it computes. We are we know that a small core is the a large core is n times faster than the than the the, the small cores. So we are using this information, and this information is uh, is related to the area. We are assuming that the the the, the execution is perfect and is the small core is always going to be n times slower than the larger core. So one small core always n times is lower than uh, the larger core itself. Does it make any sense? I think it's related to the same question that he asked before. But maybe we can talk after I finish here. Anyone has the same question? Okay. So finally, uh, your design is successful for desktop processors and a company wants to produce similar design for mobile devices. Uh, the power budget becomes the constraint and you have a uh, maximum power that you can expand of 20, uh, 20 watts. And they are asking you how much you need to reduce the dynamic power consumption of the larger core, if at all, for the best configuration of obtaining part A. Assume the parallel function is the same as before, 80% of the workload and the dynamic power they give you a hint the dynamic power of the larger core uh, is d n uh, watts where d is a constant so before it was six n's now is d you want to figure out d so we know that energy is equals to power t uh, times uh, time so this means that power is equals to energy divided by time right and you want your energy to be at most 20 watts and the same and the same as before the energy here is going to be the energy of the large core plus the energy of the small core divide by the the, the time the total time so this is going to be equal to the to the power times this is the energy is power times uh, time so this is the dynamic power for the larger core that is d right dn plus the time for the serial portion plus the i should have done this plus the static power, this is dynamic power the static power is still the same as before n, so n times this serial this is the then static, dynamic um, plus the the time that it takes for the Oh, this is going to be a count later. Plus the energy for the small core that you have before. Is it, I'm missing something? I feel like I'm missing something. Oh yes, I'm missing it. Plus the time for the static power. So E, uh, N, this is the static power for the large core. times the, 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 the time that is sitting idle, right? Parallel portion. Plus the energy for, I already counted, energy for the small, so the equation is done, divide by the total time, 0 0.13. So this is g plus one, and times t serial, plus and um, times t parallel <coughs> plus the energy of the small core divide by 0 0.13 should be 
uh, smaller than 20. And then you're going to figure out when you do the equation, you place n is equal to 2, you're going to find out that d is equal to, should be large, smaller than 0 0.3. And is asking how, assume, um, how much we need to reduce the power, right? So we know that now the dynamic power is 0.3n and before the dynamic power was 6n, right? It was here somewhere. Is 6n. So this is going to so we have that you're going to have that this is a you have to reduce the dynamic power if you divide one by the other by 20 times if you want to maintain the same performance as before so any question about this okay so the next one Okay, the question that we're going to solve now is about memory consistency, as you can see. Um, yeah, this is something that uh, Professor Mudlu has covered in uh, some of the last lectures. And um, it's something that you can also probably find in the exam next Friday. Uh, this, uh, in particular, is from the final exam uh, for uh, from the fall 2017. A uh, programmer writes the following two C code segments. She wants to run them concurrently on a multi-core processor called LSC uh, using two different threads, each of which uh, will run on a different core. The processor implements sequential consistency as we discussed in the lecture, and this is the code that the two threads uh, execute. It's very simple. As you can see, each of them composed by four instructions. X, Y, and flag have been allocated in main memory, while A and B are contained in processor registers. A read or write to any of these variables generates a single memory request. The initial values of all memory locations and variables are zero. Assume each line of the C code segment of a thread is a single instruction. That's important to keep in mind. And then part A asks, uh, what's the final value of Y0 in the SC processor after both threads finish execution? Explain your answer. So, the first thing to recall here is that the sequential consistency ensures that the order in which uh, memory accesses from a particular thread, from a particular core, are going to um, to take place is the same order as we have uh, in the program. And, um, and that's uh, very important in this processor to, uh, I mean, to uh, confirm that this update here uh, by instruction T11 is going to happen after this one here uh, from uh, instruction 1, 0. Another thing to observe here is that we are using this flag to synchronize in some way uh, thread 0 and thread 1. Observe that this instruction T 
zero two is a while loop where the uh, thread zero is going to check what's the value of the flag and while the value of the flag is zero it will keep looping there is kind of busy waiting and only after the flag is set by thread one thread zero will leave this uh, while loop and continue to the execution of T03 right so if we take uh, these uh, things into account we will see that the final value of Y0 is equal to and why is that because um, in the very beginning uh, T1 initializes that position equal to 1 and then sets the flag and because this is a sequential consistency processor it's, uh, we, we can be sure that this flag uh, update will happen after this uh, Y0 update and because of that the next thing to happen is that and after, after T1 sets the flag um, um, thread uh, 0 can uh, leave this while loop and then execute instruction uh, T03 and the final result will be equal to make sense? okay now it says what's the final value of B in the SC processor after both threads finish the execution Mm, let's see what can I do so I want you to see the code while we do the reasoning here so for B what we see is that there are two possible orderings um, in the in the um, execution here um, the first ordering let's call it O1 is happens if T10 uh, is executed before T01 and the second possible ordering happens if it, it is the other way around right T01 happens before T10 why is this possible because across threads there is no way of enforcing that this T10 happens before this 01 or the other way around so we don't know how the uh, these uh, two memory requests are, are going to be uh, served and 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 based on that any of these two ordinary orderings could happen right and if you check in this case you, you check it by yourself in this case the final value of V is going to be 1 and in this case the final value of V is going to be 0 right so if this one is executed before this one why uh, zero will be zero in the execution of this instruction, right? And that's why B is finally zero. But if this was updated before, then what we will have in B is one, which is what happens uh, if the uh, if the ordering, uh, the, the uh, sequentially consistent ordering that finally happens is uh, is O one. So the question is if T13 could happen before T01. Um, I think so. I, 
I think you are right. But you know, this doesn't change the final result because x0 is 0. You see? It is true that the solution didn't consider this ordering, but, um, but yeah, the result would be the same. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, okay, now what do we have next? It's uh, part C. And part C says, uh, with the aim of achieving higher performance, the programmer tests uh, her code on a new uh, multi-core processor called RC that implements weak consistency. As discussed in the lecture, the weak consistency model has no, uh, no need to warranty a strict order of memory operations. Um, for this question, consider a, weak, a very weak model where there is no guarantee uh, on the ordering of instructions as seen by different cores. What's the final value of Y0 in the RC processor after both reads finish execution? Explain your answer. So, um, in this case, let's go again to take a look at the code. Here is the code. So, in this case, we have three possible orderings from the perspective of, of T0. So, the first one, let's call it O1. Um, consists of T10 executing before T11 before T03. Ordering 2 is T11 before T10 before T03. And ordering 3 is T11 before T03 and before T10. Observe that here there is no, uh, I mean, no, no, no guarantee of um, any ordering in, uh, within the same thread, right? That's why uh, T01 can happen before T10, T, uh, T is, uh, one, sorry, T10 can happen before T11 or the other way around, which is what we see uh, in uh, O1 and O2. And, um, and similarly, uh, this T03 uh, could even happen before T10. Why is that? Because in the end, the only thing that we can be sure is that T03 will happen after T11 because of the flag, right? Because thread zero will not issue this T03 instruction until um, it uh, leaves the, 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 the while loop. Uh, but there is no uh, ordering guarantee for this T10. So that's why we can have uh, three different orderings. So in this case, the final value is going to be 2. In this case, final value is 2. And in this case, final value is 1. OK? Okay, and finally part D, after several months, several months, spent debugging her code, the programmer learns that the new processor includes a memory fence instruction in its ISA. So it's important that you take a look at the uh, ISA <laughs> before programming a computer. <laughs> Um, the semantics of the memory fence uh, is as follows for a given thread that executes it. Uh, first, wait, stall the processor until all preceding memory operations from the thread complete in the memory system and become visible to other cores. Second, ensure no memory operation from any later instruction in the thread gets executed before the memory fence is retired. So, 
in the and, um, a weak consistency processor, we definitely need to use fences whenever we want to enforce the ordering. There is no other way of, uh, of uh, having these uh, guarantees. So then part A, uh, for part D asks, um, what minimal changes should the programmer make to the program above to ensure that the final value I, uh, Y0 on RC is the same as that in part A on SC? explain your answer. So we obviously need to use um, this uh, memory fence instruction that we have just discovered and put it in the right place. So it's, what I'm going to do here is simply uh, rewrite the, the code to modify or include whatever additions are needed there, right? Uh, this is T12, this is T13, and here we have A equal X0, B equal A plus Y0, here we have the while loop with the flag, and here y0 plus equal 1 and then y0 is initialized then we put here the flag set the flag equal to 1 x1 multiplies by 2 and a0 that's it right so if we look at um, thread 1 where should we place the memory fence or the multiple memory fences I don't know that so in, in the end if we go back to the um, where is this if we go back to the solution of uh, the previous uh, part part C what we saw is that the uh, problem that we have inside the same thread, inside th thread 1, is that there is no uh, ordering in force uh, between these two instructions. So uh, any of those could happen before the other one, right? So if we want to enforce that order in there, the place to put the memory fence is here. Right? So this would be now like instruction one uh, in thread one. And also, in order to uh, make sure that this instruction TO3 uh, also doesn't happen before, I mean, in purity, if you look at this code, and uh, based on what are the uh, restrictions and assumptions given in the in the uh, in the question itself, this should work as is. But in reality, there are multiple accesses here, right? In this while loop, because this is a while loop, every iteration, the, the uh, th uh, thread two is going to go to memory and check if uh, uh, flag, the flag has been set or not, right? So in, 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 in this situation, if we really want to make sure that everything is going to be executed in the correct order, we need to also place a memory fence here, okay? So that could be, that is, let's say, the um, co perfectly complete solution. But um, yeah, this, this was in, in an exam. We, we found that this could happen. I mean, we, we understood that some people, uh, some, some students didn't uh, put the memory fence here. And that's why, I mean, that's why I'm clarifying this simply, right? But uh, I mean, in, uh, in reality, the, the, the right way to do it is uh, as, as you can see uh, right now on the screen. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Now we will have Nika solving the interconnect question.
sir? Oh, okay. Can you help me? <laughs> oh God! Is it good, right? That's the way. Yes. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Um. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, all set up. Uh, so this question is about uh, interconnection networks. So it says, suppose you would like to connect two to the power of m processors, and you're considered considering four different topologies. Uh, first is two uh, D mesh, and then a concentrated mesh where each router serves four processors, and then a torus and the hypercube. Then it asks to uh, like answer different questions about uh, networks with these topologies. So at first, part A uh, says that, okay, so for n equals to 4, please draw how each network looks like. Then you can use dot 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 to avoid repeated patterns. Okay. So uh, for n equals to 4, then we would have a network which is... 2 to the power of 4, the radical, and this, which would be a 4x4 four four network, basically. So, a 2D mesh is basically the uh, like a very simple knot. Basically, you just need to, like in each uh, row of the network, you put 4 routers, and then in the end also you have 4 rows. So each of these are your routers, and then like each router is uh, connected to one core. So each of these are also one core. Okay, you can put dot dot dot. So, but I just put it here to be like super clear. Uh, and then they are connected simply like this. So, so far, super easy. Let's go to the next part, which is a concentrated mesh. So here it's uh, telling us that each router serves uh, four processors, meaning we will have here one router that is connected to four cores, meaning since we have uh, basically 16 cores, we will have four of these routers. And then they are connected like a normal mesh. So can you guys uh, think of what are the benefits or disadvantages of this C mesh compared to uh, the normal 2D mesh? Can you think of something? Like, why could it be like uh, better to use C mesh? Hmm? It depends because, like, inside your router, your router would be like uh, more complex because it would have like a crossbar inside your router to connect different cores. But I get uh, what you mean here. It would be like easier or like less expensive to basically um, 
design the, the links between different routers. Basically, you would have less hop counts. From going from this score to this score, basically you, have, you need to just traverse one link. Whereas here, from this score to this score, like you need to traverse four link, uh, like three links. So it has, um, let's say, less hop count. So do you think why uh, that this one could be worse than this? As in, like, what aspects of it are, like, worse? Let's say. Well, maybe now there's contention on one same router. Yeah, exactly, because it would have a crossbar inside the router, so that would cause contention. Also, if you want to connect, like, four of these to here, you might sometimes want to also add a wider link. So that can be also a problem. Okay, good. So, speaking of uh, going from this score to this score and uh, having three hop counts, the solution, the good solution here would be um, to use a torus. So here we're going to design a 2D torus to address the same concern that we already discussed. Okay, feel free to dot 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 uh, here if you want to save time in the exam. Like I can skip this course already. So here everything is like a mesh, except we're going to add these extra link here. So then we don't have that problem that we had in mesh um, for connecting like very far nodes. Um, so can you guys think uh, what can be the problem of this one? I mean like it's expensive to add more links but is there any other problem? Is it easier to access now from like the very far left? Yeah. Far right of the road, but not from Oh, that is because? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> good. Yeah. Uh, do you think what can be like a uh, drawback of having such a router? Such a like network? Uh, maybe I can say myself. It's really difficult to route it in comparison to a mesh. In a mesh, if you think like a 2D chip, it's really easy to uh, lay it down, whereas here you need to basically have a more complex uh, layout for routing these wires. So taking the torus to a more extreme side of uh, its benefits and disadvantages is a hypercube. Here we're going to have even more connectivity and also complexity. So uh, just to uh, remind you guys what a hypercube is. So uh, here we want uh, like a four cube, let's say, because uh, our n equals to four. You can think of a cube and also a cube inside it, that these are like connected somehow here. So this is a geometric uh, aspect of it, but the way you see it in the slide is uh, simpler to understand. It is like that. It is um, one cube. And the other one that are connected like this, and then like so on and so forth. So even uh, here I want to draw an even simpler version of it so we can basically mark the routers and the cores. So we can have one square here of different routers. Again here. So I'm kind of unfolding this thing so we can see actually where the routers and the cores are. So here is the uh, core. Yeah. So you already know what I mean here also. OK. 
Okay? Now I'm gonna connect here to here. Let's see. And kind of like the same. You can maybe use different colors not to have a mess I have here. So, okay. So again, like we have more connectivity and uh, like, of course, a lot more complexity. So let's see uh, what the next part is asking. It says, okay, so now uh, some of your n is eight. Calculate the number of network links for uh, each network. And it says that, okay, a single network link is bi-directional. So like here, we can go from here to here and also vice versa. So let's see, um, let's take a look at the whole solution. <coughs> okay, yeah. So, so we call the, these uh, the links that connect basically different uh, routers network links. So do not count these guys, just count these ones. So let's see how many, so let's get inspired by the n equal to four to come up with uh, like a formula for n equals to n. Here we see that we have three um, or like n minus one, uh, not n minus one, like um, two to the power of n minus one here links in each row, and also we have four rows. Basically these guys uh, get repeated four times, and you have the same story happening for the columns. So you can say that for uh, links for a 2D mesh, would be two to the power of n minus one per each row, and then you also have these many um, rows. And then if you do the same thing for columns, you need to multiply by two. So let's think if our n equals to eight, so that will be like 15 multiplied by 16 multiplied by two. Jeez. Magically 480. Okay, so let's think of here. So here, the, for both um, n equals to four or eight, we know that our rotors can have uh, basically four processors. So a concentrated mesh is like a mesh, but each router serves four. So let's um, take this into account. Links for a C mesh, concentrated mesh would be, so this is divided by uh, four, right? Like this minus two. Which here would be seven multiplied by eight multiplied by two. Okay. Let's take a look here. Um, again, we see that instead of like three links per, per each row, we can count four because of these extra ones. So here we don't need to add minus one for these um, links of torus, right? So that will be just is okay. here for this hypercube um, like it's not so easy to think of like any cost to eight after seeing any cost to four but it definitely helps if you compute the links for this one and then be inspired into how to think for the number of links for um, let's say uh, any cost to eight so if you look at this uh, simple one, 
we also don't want to count the links twice. So here we have a cube. So for n equals to 4, we have like 12 links. And also four of these guys that connect this one to this one. So basically, assume these four are assigned to this one, and these four links are assigned to the outer one. So it would be like 16 per cube, and then like two cubes. So this is for the case that we have 16 cores. So here you can somehow think through this way I have thought, or through whatever way you want to think of. So I ran out of space. So here, links for i per q would be basically 2 to the power of 4 here, like n. And like you have two cubes, then you can think that if you have equal to 8, you would have 4 cubes. So it would be n to the 2. Uh, and um, divided by 2, which I am looking from the answers, is this much. So this is the way, like this division, that was the way I tried to like model or like scale up. But if you look a little bit more, like study more about hypercubes, then that will be also easy to um, compute this one, or like think of it. But just like you can count it the way you're more comfortable with. So let's see here. So it again says that uh, assume n is equal to 8. Calculate the number of input output ports, including the injection injection ports for each router in these topologies. And then hint is that give answer to all types of routers that exist in an ir irregular network. So here it's asking about uh, input and output ports. So do not confuse that with links. So links are the ones that connect um, the routers together. But here, let's again visit our previous solutions. Here, this one is, for example, can be like an input and output port. So we should remember to count this. OK. So here, also pay attention here. It says give answer to all types of routers that exist in an irregular network. Uh, our simple straightforward 2D mesh, for example, is an irregular network uh, in this sense. Because if you see the routers here have like five um, ports, whereas here you have three ports, sorry, four, and then here you have three. So just pay attention to these like minute details. Again, let's be inspired by our solution for n uh, equals to four to come up with the uh, expressions for n equal to 8. So for this n equal to 4, we see that, um, so for mesh, it really doesn't matter, right? Because it's just like a chessboard. So it would be 4 plus 1, 3 plus 1, and 2 plus 1, right? Or Okay. So, so far clear? Okay. So, here for a concentrated mesh, we will have four already added. So, instead of this uh, plus one thing that we added, we need to have uh, plus four. So here we will see all the routers look like the same, but if your n is eight, then you would like scale down in a, in a scale up in a mesh, and then like look like a mesh of routers that each of them connect to four more uh, input output ports for cores, right? So again, the solution for C mesh would be C plus four, or three plus four, or two plus four or 4 plus 4. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, let's visit the torus. 
So Taurus, uh, although it's a more uh, complex uh, network in comparison to a uh, 2D mesh, it uh, does not have any irregularities, right? Because these uh, guys in the edge also are connected to um, different links. So for all of them, um, you basically have um, four. And also one for core. Let's not forget this one. Because here you have four here, 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 and also one connected to the core. Uh, for hypercube, okay. Let's look at this geometric shape, for example, or like these ones, whatever is easier. We see that every node is basically connected to four. So we would assume that, and also like one for its core. So we would assume that for n equals to eight, we would be like n plus one, which is nine. Okay, let's go to the next part. Next uh, part is the easiest part. So assume a network link can be faulty. For each topology, what is the minimum possible number of faulty links that are needed to make at least one processor unreachable from any other processors? Okay, let's revisit our solution again. Here, for example, the nodes at the middle have a better life because, sorry, yeah. Let me think for a second. So we would have 256, right? And um, sorry, uh, divided by four, how much would it be? This is power of eight, uh, 64, right? 64 would be, sorry, eight by eight, right? So we can't get, right? Or. Uh, Okay, yeah. <coughs> okay. So here, uh, let's get back to this part and we discuss your question after. So the, we want to see that how many of the links should be um, like faulty in order to make a processor isolated. So uh, intuitively the nodes that are at the middle have a lot of links connected to them so they have better life. So the worst um, life goes to these nodes in the corner because if these two links get um, disconnected then there's no way to uh, reach to them for you from any other node. So here for mesh the answer would be And for C mesh, again this router, if you want to isolate it, again the answer would be two. So no matter how much you scale up uh, your concentrated mesh, you again would have a mesh. So the nodes in the corner will again have a bad life like the one in um, like a normal mesh. Let's look here. So torus, uh, if you remember, we discussed that it doesn't have the irregular structure that the mesh has. So all the nodes are like the middle nodes, basically. So all of them are accessible by five links. So in order to isolate them, we need to remove all the four links. Let's look at our hypercube. Here we have, uh, we discussed that each um, basically node is connected to n uh, different links. So in order to be, and it doesn't have also irregular pattern, all of them are connected to uh, basically n links. So in order to disconnect them, we have to 
basically have faults into eight links. I think that's the solution for this one. Relatively easier question, I think. So do you guys have any questions? Okay, good. Okay, so if you don't have any other questions, then we're done. Uh, good luck with the, with the exam next Friday and <coughs> with the rest of your exams as well. Um, I would suggest that you still uh, take the opportunity or take advantage from the three office, office hours that we have next week and also Moodle. Uh, but I would recommend you to post your Moodle questions before Thursday because I don't think that we will be available for answering questions on Thursday and Friday morning. That's just a recommendation. Okay, thank you.